Welcome back to the Capes and Tights podcast right here on capesandtights.com. I'm your host once again, Justin Soderberg. Today we welcome comic book writer Jude Ellison S. Doyle to the podcast to talk their comic books and more. Jude has written and is author and columnist for a bunch of things, but is the writer of Trainwreck, The Woman We Love to Hate, Mock, and Fear, and Why, came out in 2016, and Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers, Monstrosity, Patriarchy, and, and the Fear of Female Power that came out in 2019, but also was the creator of Ma, five-issue comic book series that came out at Boom Studios in 2021. And now we are here to talk for a comic book that comes out March 22nd, 2023, called The Neighbors over at Boom Studios as well. So check out our conversation right here on this episode but before you do check us out on apple and spotify five stars please rate review follow subscribe all that stuff as well as find us on social media on instagram facebook and twitter this is jude ellison s doyle writer of the comic book the neighbors enjoy everybody welcome how are you I'm really well. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I'm here in Bangor, Maine, and it's a little chilly today. It's starting to warm up, but today's a little cold. So I'm 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 at the space heater on. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm in upstate New York. It's the middle of March, and I just got a notice from my electric company that like there might be a blizzard and I might lose power in the middle of the night. Don't worry yes. about it. Yes. <laughs> yes, we have that coming. I think Tuesday night there's supposed to be some snow. And I was just funny because I have a two-year-old and we were out in the lawn. I had the garage door open, cleaning out some of the stuff in the garage door yesterday. And today it's like, like my wife comes back in from outside and she's like, yeah, it's definitely winter still. I'm like, ah, oh, God damn it. But that, <laughs> I thought we were at the end of this thing. And it's just funny. It's a true Mainer thing for me to do is complain about the weather. We have such great weather for most of the year. Yeah. And then you, we always complain about the weather in the Northeast. It's just kind of funny. That's I just have this like incredibly romantic picture of Maine because I read a book where a girl goes to Maine when I was seven. And ever since then, I've just imagined you all like in fisherman sweaters, standing <laughs> on rocky coast, looking out to sea. And that's like all you do, basically. Yes. I am wearing way. a flannel shirt. So there you go. There's some of that, uh, the a little <laughs> glimpse of the, what Maine is like. No, it's funny because like when it snows, it's beautiful. And then they plow it and it looks like shit because all the mud and all that crap that's out there. But like, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, I had the conversation over the weekend with someone about like how we have maybe if you combine all the winter months, like two weeks ish of really just shitty weather. And then in the summer months, there's like a week of like a hundred degree weather, but the rest of the year is awesome. So I don't know why we have to complain up here about weather up here so much, but you know, and it's a very common conversation to have is the conversation about the weather in Maine. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like in North Carolina, South Carolina area, there's not as much conversation about the weather. No. Well, I feel like they just... the weather is nice. <laughs> and it's like the same every day. It's not... You're like, you know, out in the rugged edge of nature. You've got to, you've got to converse with nature. You've got to give the the primal gods their due. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so we're here to talk about comic books and stuff. Uh, obviously, uh, we're here to talk about the neighbors, but I would also like to get to know Jude a little bit and what you are, uh, how, what is your, I hate to say the words, but comic book origin story. How are you, how did you get into reading, collecting comic books and how did that lead into creating comic books? Yeah. Well, I had, I think like every queer person you're ever going to talk to is going to give you this origin story, but I had, you know, my intense fixation on X-Men comics in the mm -hmm. 90s. That was like, I just sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at doing things like a normal person. I went to a comic book store when I was 12 because they just like erected one in the strip mall down my street. <laughs> and I just was like, I am going to buy some comics and then I'm going to find a comic I'm a fan of and be a fan of that comic. And I did. Eventually I did. It was Generation X, um, the like the 90s teen like notoriously, none of those characters had like any value to the main plot line at all. And they were all <laughs> killed immediately in like the early 2000s. But um, 
except for Emma Frost. She's doing well. Yeah, but, she's doing well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I had that. And when I was in college, um, I was with someone who was like really super active. I think he's still super active. I think he like runs one of the bigger sort of comic clubs up in Brooklyn. But um, he introduced me to more intense like indie comics. He had me reading Phoebe Gluckner, which I loved. Um and just a lot of James Kachalka for some reason. James Kachalka was very like that early 2000s twee Brooklyn scene mm -hmm. had a lot of Kachalka in it. Um, and that was also when I started writing comic scripts because I just wanted to see if I could do it. At the time, like I, it's pretty easy to get a gig as a nonfiction writer in New York. Like I was, you know, by the time I was out of, you know, college I was writing random anonymous reviews of like plays that were attended in the park by three people but I could not figure out how to crack comics it just like sort of had to go into the drawer of like things I wish I could do and will be really weirdly jealous when other people get to do them but it's probably not for me mm -hmm. um and that changed uh I was approached by Chris Rosa at Boom Studios because he like I had a newsletter on horror. I was writing a book on horror at the time. And he's like, you really seem to understand this. <laughs> you seem to spend a lot of time thinking about this genre. And it seems to me like you have a, a grasp on plot and character. And I would like to see like, if you have anything lurking around. And I immediately sent Chris Rosa like 29,000 emails <laughs> trying to match a thing. <laughs> until I eventually, eventually sold one. Um, but that was, and that was what happened. I got, I got a very nice man took an interest in me and Boom Studios <laughs> has been very kind to me ever since. Yeah, Boom, there's just, I don't know of one person, that, first of all, they wouldn't publicly say it anyway, likely, but I don't know anybody behind the scenes who have told me that they have had a bad relationship with Boom as a creator, uh, and, and which is a pretty cool thing. And I have heard a number of stories like that, not that specific story, but like where someone's like, do you have anything? Because we really want to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that, that's a good thing, right? When someone, when someone says that too. So, and then obviously that was, uh, I'm guessing that's Ma, what you're talking about, a five-issue miniseries that came over at Boom uh, in, what, 2021? Uh, yeah, it was 2021, September yeah. 2021 when it came out. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that is a very good series. Obviously, I have, if anybody can is watching it, I have a... Oh, my gosh. Uh, there she is. Right there, back there. Right with, behind I think you. Wow. She hulks in you front of You her. don't want her behind you. She's no good. No. I <laughs> There's something about that cover, too, with the word, the mouth and the wording right in the middle of it is just, like, perfect, too, because there's not very many comic books where the words, the comic book is in the, 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 the trade dress is in the middle of the comic book, either, yeah. which is kind of cool. I, you know, there's yeah, certain ones. the mouth imagery in that one is so creepy. And it's the Ariella Christentina cover. Yes. She did a variant cover for Neighbors that's so great. And she's one of the only people who chose to draw Agnes. I think she drew Agnes. And mm -hmm. that's um, that's one of my favorite characters. Nobody likes her because she's just a crazy old woman who lives next door. <laughs> <laughs> which is obviously the one in which I've invested like the most emotional energy. <laughs> um, that's uh, that's amazing. So I mean, so now that you're now you're a comic book writer, is what you're what you are. No, just you, you're you're obviously multi talented, multi different facets. But what does a typical day look like now uh, for you? Does are you write, still writing scripts and, and writing things for the next thing? Or are you still working on the neighbors? Uh, obviously, you have uh, five issue series, but. The Neighbors is wrapping up. We're okay. still looking at covers. I'm still getting inks. I haven't gotten final inks for issue four yet. And okay. that's probably one of my favorite issues in the series. So I'm really excited for that. Um, so we're just wrapping up The Neighbors. Right now, like my typical day is I've somehow committed myself to do a lot, <laughs> a lot of different things that are all very different from each other. So I have, you know, a column at Medium where I can just like talk about my feelings forever and I'm doing a lot of reporting for a queer magazine called Extra, which is great okay. because I'm just like running around and talking to people and I get to feel like I'm, you know, a, an ace reporter. I'm probably not, but I'm just like, I'm gonna crack this one right wide open. <laughs> you know. Um, so I'm doing a lot of that. And I'm just like, I'm at that place where it's like, it seems like I know what the next big project is going to be, but I'm waiting to find mm -hmm. out formally what it is. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. 
Uh, what we need, I feel like you need like a, uh, a, you know, a comic book about your life doing this ace reporting, like Jimmy Olsen or something <laughs> like that. Like you're the reporter, you know, just do something like that, like a self, you know, it'd be a really a fictionalized really version of yourself. Though. All just like the guy sitting at this one desk, like every yeah. panel is essentially the same image. But, you know, <laughs> That's all you do. It's, it's literally a, a revolutionary comic book. Every panel is the same image. But the wording on every panel is different. Mm. <laughs> Maybe you have different facial expressions. That's it. <laughs> like like confusion. That where it's just like three hours of her kneading meat. It's just, that's me. It's stuff <laughs> I'm typing. It's less visually compelling than kneading Well, meat. isn't that what you're supposed to do if you work in an office space with someone and you're supposed to like look like you're like thinking or you're like look up at the sky like you're thinking <laughs> about something. It looks like you're working really hard even though you're just staring yeah. off into the distance. That would be a great book. No, uh, not as good. Not as good as the neighbors. How long has the neighbors been percolating before? Obviously, you did Ma, but like, was this like immediately right after? Was this also a story you had going on in your head at the time, or is this something that came out afterwards or came into your What's head? What's crazy is that like both Ma and um, the neighbors. Now I can now that I've written them, I can see that I kind of always wanted to do them. One of my things that I was like really weirdly invested in in my like brief pathetic failed college script writing career was like I want to do a version of Peter Pan but he's evil <laughs> and, like somehow that idea found its way into the neighbors with everything else mm -hmm. um I had I had a few stories I really liked I still have one story that I really like from the period between Ma and the neighbors that like I I suspect that I'll go back to that one in a year and I'll figure out how to crack it and I'll pitch it and it'll you know hopefully work out but um I had a lot of ideas that just like felt like fun or that I wanted to write them the neighbors was the one that just sort of it fell into my lap and as soon as I started writing it down I knew what it was going to be and you know like when you've been writing for a while you probably know this you have some things that like you could write mm -hmm. and you could execute them and you have some things that just want to be written mm -hmm. and this did because it was pulling on a lot of really primal stuff for me it was pulling on a lot of like old folk tales and a lot of old gross like books like what is that book the constant friend I think it's called this old book of like English folk magic where like everything involves killing an animal or like rubbing a dead animal on your body in some way <laughs> um, the thing Agnes is doing in the first issue where she's like passing the snake hand to mm -hmm. hand and then putting it on her face. It's like, that's supposedly you can get a snake to do you favors that way. You pass it hand to hand until it falls asleep and then you breathe on it and then it spies for you. So you the know? funny thing is it's never going to happen to me because I don't want to hold the snake. So like, <laughs> but you could have so many snakes on your team. Snakes could be doing these interviews right now. Yes. <laughs> You could be relaxing. Well, you don't notice. It's like right below my feet right now. There's just tons of snakes that you don't know about. They're all exactly. it's really my snake. My snake is just my Roomba. It's just cleaning the floors. <laughs> uh, no, I just I, I just couldn't see that happening. Me holding a snake like that would not be not be fun. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is, is that I think when I first read, like there's the title of the neighbors. All I could think about is how I hate having neighbors. Um, <laughs> Like it's just in general because like my wife and I we live in a, 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 a townhouse, so I have a neighbor. She, our neighbor is actually really awesome, and that's one of the reasons why it's okay to have a neighbor. But I just thought to myself, like I don't think I could ever live in an apartment complex anymore because I just am so annoyed with other people's noises, like whether they're walking <laughs> or they're just like a microwave sound coming through or something. I just can't stand you know, that kind of stuff. My wife picks on me all the time for because of it because I have like very particular, she was looking at a new duvet for our bed and she's like, yeah, the reviews say it's very loud. And she goes, I could knew you couldn't have that because you just couldn't deal with the, the noise coming from the blanket. I'm like, okay, you know me too well. No, but like I thought to myself, like I just don't like the neighbors, but to have neighbors like this is even, even batshit crazier than the neighbors <laughs> who just are loud, like uh, yeah. the handling snakes and the folklore part of it. Um, mm -hmm. And then the cover itself. I hate the idea of judging a book by its cover, but like, let's be honest, in the comic book industry, that's what we have to do, right? I mean, in a sense, when you walk into your LCS and there's just comic books on the shelf, especially with the number of comic books that are out now, um, a comic book has to draw you in. And that cover A is just like, with the arms reaching in, the characters are all down the middle. It's just like, it, first of all, it's creepy. And second of all, it just draws you in and go, what the hell is this? And I need to read it. So 
I, I will say I hate this idea of judging a book by its cover, but I definitely judged a book by a cover. And that's why I wanted to pick it. I love that cover too. It's yes. so good. It's so good. All the Miguel Mercado covers are super yes. good for this series. And that was the first time, like it's a it's a particular, you know, set of characters that I'd had in my mind for a while. Mm -hmm. I knew in particular that like with drawing Oliver, you have to be careful because he's a trans guy. He's early mm -hmm. in his transition. We're going to be taken further back and forth into different points of his life. And you just, you want to draw him in a way that, you know, is recognizable without like inviting the reader to gawk at him in a weird way. And like the first time I saw them all together on that cover, I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> like yes, i was yes. so happy i was like yes this is every single person on that cover is a real person and i know who they are and this is this is now gonna work that was kind of the moment where i was like okay i think this is gonna actually work yeah and that must be the difference between some people who are cartoonists who can who are who are who do the you know writing and scripting and the illustration it's like they can think of what the person looks like in their head can immediately draw it or sketch it at least excuse me and see what it is when you have another artist doing your work and you're explaining to that artist what you think that this person looks like and then they draw it. you're like oh now they're real they're a real person in front of me and seeing that cover <laughs> with your character your creations on it is it's pretty badass if you think about it yeah and that's been i mean to be honest for me that's been some of the most liberating mm -hmm. you know because when you're a writer especially like a lot of writers of my generation started out like me, like just writing blogs and just self-publishing shit, right? And you are very much in control of all that. And after a while, you get to know your voice and you get to know what you need to do to get a point across or like write something people are going to like. But when you are, you know, as you say, dependent on the artist, it really mm -hmm. forces you to be a better writer. The first approach to the script was before Letizia Cadenici came on board. And I was thinking about it in terms of like that 1963 uh, Shirley Jackson adaptation, The Haunting or Crimson mm -hmm. Peak. Like if you're familiar with those as visual works, every single panel is just like stocked with details and mm -hmm. it's crowded and it's claustrophobic. And that's kind of where the unease comes from. And Letizia's style, I loved because she just like, she has this intuitive grasp of like, what's the emotional moment in this scene? And she can subtract pretty much everything but what you absolutely need to see. And that absolutely, like, she was almost like an uncredited editor, editor on the project because mm -hmm. I found myself writing to her style and not to, like, my own little inner imagination world. And it made the book a lot sharper and a lot cleaner. In, in her style of, of of art and illustration, too, gives you that that realism, but not too far into realism. So, like... One of the biggest complaints I have about things in general in, in media is uh, uh, trying. If I'm trying to connect this to what real world, my biggest, I should start this over. My biggest love for horror comic books nowadays or comic books nowadays is the this is based in the real world with something small that changes it that you that makes it so it's like this is believable, but yet maybe not because it's obviously it is fiction. Um, whereas sometimes you have too realistic of a book and something crazy happens. You're like, this is not real. This can't be real. <laughs> but if it's also yeah. like one of my favorite uh, writers is obviously is uh, James Tiny in the fourth and yeah. what he, his connection with like department of truth book, there's mm. almost too messy. I, uh, Martin Simmons is one of the amazing artists. I can't do what he does, but almost too messy on the inside of it in a sense mm -hmm. that like it, it's hard for me to understand what's going on whereas something like this book is it's in the middle it's got like realism but also cartoonism to yeah. abstractness but also the idea like you mentioned that like if i'm trying to focus on the characters in the front of the page what's happening in the background is is not necessarily needing to be very busy and i have a couple of friends of mine who are artists who almost too much pay attention to what the picture frame is in the background and it takes away because it's so immaculate in the background but then the whole picture is just too focused on whatever's happening in the background that it is actually with the people who are speaking in front and i think that's what this does and you mentioned that like you know how i'm just flipping through the preview uh pdf and like how there's like a bunch of characters in the beginning in the background is a little bit like just a pink or a tan wall like it's not there's nothing going on on it because you're trying to focus on the characters in the front of it so yes it's very well well illustrated the colors are amazing 
Yeah. Um, lettering I was, I was really is perfect. Happy to get that brought in, you know, like again, you're just like, like I loved Ma's colors too because it was this mm. washed out '70s look, and mm -hmm. I felt I found that really exciting for the story. But this felt to me like something that just needed to have you know, like a gothic feeling. It needed to have those really dark, beautiful colors and a lot of shadows falling and a lot of sort of hyper-saturated, all of those stained glass windows in the house. Like, mm -hmm. I love the way the house looks now because you get that sense of just space and depth and darkness and age and little shots of beauty here and there. It's just, it's really lovely. They really pulled that off. The best part is too, if like if you just like if someone to pick this book up and it didn't have the cover on it and you just open to page one, I think people would immediately go, "Oh, this is a boom book!" Like it just looks like a boom <laughs> book, <laughs> which is amazing. Which is not a that's not a that's a great thing to say because of how uh, quality of books that Boom's been putting out. But just like a funny thing is like I'm flipping through this. Like if you got halfway through, you're like, "I wonder who put, published it." You definitely know that it seems like it's in Boom's <laughs> category of books, and, and it's obviously a horror comic book, and it's obviously has a lot of folklore and things like that in it, but there's obviously an easy way. You could have just written a book about a trans person or a queer person and have a different story on it, but you mix the two together, which is great, because I am, as a cis white male and 37-year-old cis white male, <laughs> I don't have this background i was brought, grew up in a conservative christian home my dad's a pastor and so like i until i became an adult and th could think of my own did i have even accepting views of the entire world of what we what we live in and if i was just trying to learn more about or have a story about a, someone who was queer i i and it was solely about that i may not have picked this book up when i was younger like you know what i mean like i wouldn't have the I, even tried it but because it's a horror yeah. book with these elements in it i feel like that mixture allows us to open our eyes to more what's going on in the world but also get a story that goes along with it too it's not just this is a book about a queer person this is a horror book yeah. that features a queer person which i love yeah and i mean i feel like that was partly by design that like so much of the initial setup of neighbors is very much like it's classic like you've you've seen the shining mm -hmm. you have seen the amityville horror you know what happens when a family yes. moves to a small town and a big old house that they shouldn't be able to afford you know like you have an understanding of this from other stories and from there we can talk about the specificity of you know what it's like for these particular people mm -hmm. and why this town is scary and dangerous for them we can talk about you know like the paranoia of living in a place in a time where like you just honestly don't know what people are thinking when they look at you and you don't know if you can trust them and it feels overwhelming to even go outside like i think that's a pretty common experience for mm -hmm. a lot of especially in like early transition when you aren't used to being stared at it's like ooh. but um but like it's not I don't have to be because other people have done this work for me I don't have to come out here and be like here's what the experience is I don't have to be an educational figure yes like Maya Kababe has fought that war like genderqueer has been endlessly shit upon and attacked and it's a great book but I can just be like this is a house and it's spooky and there mm -hmm. are some gay people here let's proceed you know <laughs> like, exactly it's opening up that that there's not just your typical people your typical what, what, what people perceive as typical people what people perceive as the normal family or so on and so forth which i grew up on like i mentioned is you know i live in maine too we've talked about that Maine is predominantly, or especially where I live in Maine, is predominantly white. Um, it's predominantly <clears throat> in my area, the town I live in. During the election, there was Trump signs everywhere. So, like, I am in, in, in pushed and forced into seeing all these other things. But opening up people's eyes to things nowadays, <clears throat> excuse me, is great. And then putting it into a story like this. And I talked to uh, Matt Carr, actually, earlier this morning, whose episode came out, will come out right before yours, is... He wrote a book called Mise en Place, which is about uh, uh, the restaurant industry, really. Not really, but like it's a, based in a restaurant, and it's about how Earth ran out of food, and they got this food from outer space. It's a cool comedy, pulp, uh, pop comic book. It's pretty funny. Um, but what I was saying is that he used to work in the restaurant industry, so he wrote something that he knows. Like it's yeah. easy for him to, to write a 
book that's based in the restaurant industry because he has information about it. I couldn't and I wouldn't put it upon myself to write a comic book that's a horror comic book that features queer uh, people in it because I am not and I don't know the experiences that you may go through in life. It makes sense to write what you know and to put that in there. So it's not like I feel like some people might look at this and go, well, you're just trying to force in yeah. this this these people into like these these I say these people as in like these characters in your book not like these people <laughs> I wasn't trying to be the, <laughs> these people no but the characters you have in your book you're not trying to force these characters into the book so that you go this is who I am and I'm going to show everybody who I am this is like I can write about this because I have experienced this and that's to me is huge to me is to have someone you know whether it be a uh, you know person who uh, you know identifies as a female writes about a female character that's yeah. someone they know. Like it's the same thing. So I just I appreciate that when I read it, I wasn't going into it realizing that I wish I should have probably with, with uh, uh you know with Ma and all that stuff. Like I I should have gone into it with the idea of saying like obviously there might be something in it that connects directly to you, but I'm glad I read it because of, because of that it, it opened like I said I'm trying to look to open my eyes to more things and this is an amazing uh, uh I hate to say stepping stone or something in there so people can get in there and be like okay it's a book about horror but it also features queer people i that, that's i just i don't want to i feel like i'm just rambling on here about this but like it's hard for me to explain no. but i'm just saying I, that you did a and very I mean, good I job get, on that i get what you're saying that like it's not like nobody wants to pick up a horror comic and be like no i'm going to learn you know yes like, yes, yes jordan peele can make you learn but that's because he's incredibly funny and incredibly sharp and he yeah. loves the genre and every moment of that is going to be really entertaining for you like it's it's not a lesson the neighbors is not a lesson like it's honestly been hard for me to promote because it's about stuff that sounds really corny when i try to say it like this is in a weird way it's a comic book about what i think love is mm -hmm. and how much someone can change before they stop being themselves you know like, what is it that makes someone the person you love? Like, that's that's what this is. And it's a pretty human story. And, you know, mm -hmm. trans people have pretty human stories. I'm fairly boring. I live, you know, in the suburbs with my little kid who I love and my husband who I love. And, you know, like, that that should be as unexceptional as any other experience. It's just that, like, right now, the question of whether queer and trans people even have the right to raise children. Yes, is being really vehemently, horrifyingly debated in the in the nation. I mean, I think hopefully if you just come to this as it's a human story about a family that comes to a place and gets <laughs> gets creatures sicked on them, then you know the the rest of it, the the poetry of it or the subtext of it'll sort itself out. It's a it's a story about a family and it's a story about people. And that's you know? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at in the long run is that like you should yeah you should uh. <laughs> We should be able to write what we want and the future, hopefully the future of comic books and books and, and media and stuff, stuff like that. There isn't this, oh, there's queer people in this. There's just people in it What yeah. that happen to be queer. And that that's the thing that I hope that we get to in the future. And I hope maybe, you know, people reading this book and later on they start to write books about it and so on and so forth. And again, I think one of the things that we dealt with with race and uh, you know male female uh part in marvel and dc comic books over the years i mean it superheroes are basically white men right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like historically superheroes were white men and then the women were objectified in these things that there's definitely couldn't fight crime wearing these outfits because <laughs> most of them couldn't even walk around the house wearing oh, the outfits uh, that they're wearing those like 90s catwoman <laughs> drawings where yes. she's like, oh my yeah <laughs> it was just it was funny, and that, so like there's this. So we've had this, we've had to deal with this over the years, and over the years, it's been getting better and better and better in that sense. And I think the next stage is things like, like I said, having just characters be different than what you typically would think the characters in comic books are. And I think that's what you get uh, in the mixture. But again, I'm not trying to overly do it to people who are listening or watching. This is this is a horror book, which is amazing that yeah. had, features this in there. But I'm glad because you're getting the experiences and you're getting. Well, not the experiences, but you're getting um, a story from someone who who somewhat lives 
this kind of story, obviously you're not living with monsters and, and <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know how your neighbors are, but I don't, it, this, this didn't come from them, right? This is not because your neighbors are crazy, right? <laughs> no, there was an old lady who kept coming over and leaving gifts for my daughter on our porch. That was very unsettling. I bet she's probably a super nice person yes. and she's going to pick this up and be like, oh my, I, I set off something in this man's mind that I did not intend to. But <laughs> this, per this person's name is not Agnes, is it? No, no. <laughs> I'm not going to that... tell you her name. She's, okay. she's probably out there. She's probably just a really nice woman who gives yes. gifts to neighborhood children. And there's no Hansel and Gretel subjects <laughs> involved. But that's not what I see. Um, but, like, it's... Yeah. Where were we? <laughs> it's it's fine. It, it, so, so, yeah. So, getting past this. So, neighbors... what? Oh, I remembered what I wanted to say. Go ahead. Which is that, like, yeah, this this is allowed to be horror. And I think that, like, just as much as I want to think I'm, like, woke and revolutionary, I'm really not. I think this is the direction <laughs> things are going. Charlie Jane Anders just wrote an X-Person, yep. you know, or has a new X-Men out there. Um, there's, you know, I'm I'm not at the vanguard of anything at all, and I'm comfortable with that. Yes. I just want to, like, write my you know, weird little special interest stories where I somehow managed to convince you that spending like my entire youth reading old Irish folklore was not in fact the act of a loser. It's <laughs> yes. all turned around now. Now now it's useful. You only <laughs> wrote this you only wrote this book to prove people wrong when you're young. <laughs> yes. You should why why are you reading that? See, I knew it was for something. See, I told you guys it was for something. <laughs> yeah. But uh <laughs> The benefit you also get, though, with like creating your own characters, is you can create them the only way. The hard thing that people have and people outside the creators have in the wider range of Marvel, DC, and any of these long-term intellectual properties is you're changing their youth if you end up changing something. If you end up saying, oh, by the way, this person was gay all along. They're just yeah. now coming out and telling people about it. Is it, You're changing something. You're changing history in that sense. Like, I... I I, I mean, I changed my mom's history to like, yes. mom's <laughs> but, but my point would be is that yeah. the fact that you're creating these characters from ground up. So there's no preconceived notion on who these characters are. You're going, no, this is who this person is. You know, yeah. this is how they're going to be and so on and so forth, which is, which is easy for us to handle. Cause I can't be like, that's not right because you created them. <laughs> this is not, <laughs> there's nothing based on anything. So that's what's cool about independent comic books and create your own comic books is the fact that you don't have to worry about anything that it came before it. It's you. Yeah. And if, if, if by the fifth issue, you're like, wait, kind of wish that this was different. You could go back and change pre the number one issue, something in retro, obviously if it worked, um, but you can't really do that with, with Miss Marvel or with, you know, Superman, yeah. you, you have a lot longer of a background to have to deal with that. So that's pretty cool. And I think that that's like, it's sort of a conversation people have been having more widely is that like, if you have horror that exists to explain what a marginalization is, that's mm -hmm. like, just like a teaching moment, you know, narrative that in a weird way is still centering people who aren't that. Like Ma is about sexual assault and I kind of wrote it really specifically for survivors of sexual assault. It's about pretty deep trauma mm -hmm. and rage and bleakness and bitterness. And the people who write to me about it are like, yeah, I, I have PTSD and I'm messed up. And it makes sense to me that someone would be this angry, mm -hmm. right? Like, I didn't want to write a comic book explaining why rape was bad, because if you need that explanation, you're past my help. Yes. you know <laughs> like and i think that you know if you just start from your own perspective whether or not you know what your marginalization is if you start from your own priors like i mean you and i are talking about this uh the day after the oscars where everything yes. everyone all at once just won like everything yes and it really like the family in that and the mother in that specifically is just like it starts from the assumption that you know how this family operates and you know mm -hmm. who they are. And there's not a lot of time spent explaining why these people are who they are. You, It's written very clearly for people of a certain Asian American experience. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us get to participate in that because it's an amazing story, you know? Mm -hmm. So just writing from your own humanity, I think, is the most radical thing you can do because it presupposes that people are going to be mm -hmm. able to write. 
identify with you. Everybody who has ever had a kid identifies with being scared for their kids. Yes. Everybody who has ever been a teenager identifies with being a little shit to the adults in charge. <laughs> you know, like it's you have been these people, whether or not you know it, you've been in love. You've had people you cared for. You've had your family shake up in ways you weren't prepared for. You've been afraid. And just the fact that people have a marginalized identity, you know, that's that's part of it. And that mm-hmm. undeniably informs what their reactions are and what they're afraid of. It identify, you know, it informs the way they see the world. But human stories are human stories. You know, mm-hmm. everybody's invited, you know. Just start from the truth and it'll be made apparent, you know, that everybody fundamentally has a human soul, (laughs) I guess. That, again, it's really hard for me to talk about this book because, like, I don't think of myself as a corny, sentimental person. But, like, Mm -hmm. I, for some reason, it felt really important to me to write a book about, like, how families operate and how hair within a family works or doesn't work and so I ultimately just like end up I'm supposed to be telling you about like creepy fungus and trees that smell like corpses and I'm just like everybody has a human soul I end up in a very very inspirational place on this yes. not great <laughs> but um it, it, it there also is this um we talk about there's the face of the family and the love and, and, and obviously we talk about someone who's trans. This is also a, a story of um parents and a kid, whereas like I don't want to give too much away about the comic book, but there's a there's a one line that says I'm not calling you dad. And yeah. that to me is a which which obviously throughout the rest of the book there's more that goes into that. But like the the idea that there's even just you know traditional i hate to use the word traditional but what we've perceived as traditional families of uh, a step parent or something like that asking about uh, uh not call, uh, calling someone dad or not so there's there's this wider thing to it too it's not even just the fact that this person's dealing with it I'll, a bunch of people deal with that too but well, who's your dad and stuff like that i mean i have uncles that are more of an uncle than me than they're actually my actual uncles are if that makes any sense, like there's people who, so like what, what is a family is, it is a weird statement to make because family, I feel like it's like, you know, like you say, um, home is where the heart is. I feel like family is more like who cares about you the most and who you care about to the most, just because they're blood doesn't mean they're physically family. I have better relationships, like I said, better relationships with people who aren't blood sometimes than there are people who are blood. Who do I yeah. consider my family? I have my best friend in the world who is my best man. I'm 37. He's in his late fifties. And he's my best friend. He's the best. He was my best man in my wedding, but he's what most people look, go. Oh, is that your dad? When we go places, and I know it's my friend, but he's he's not even related to me in any way. But I would consider him my family. Like I would do. I would die for him. And so there's this family structures and what we could perceive as traditional family structures should be all blown up because it doesn't matter if someone's blood or not. Family is who you love and care about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think that that's. That's a really interesting conversation. I think it's part of the conversation with this work is that like, if you expect family to always look one way, if you think Mm -hmm. that a family is only successful, if it does look that way, then ultimately that just, that is really repressive and it prohibits you from experiencing all the care that you could be experiencing. It often reinforces really ugly, abusive dynamics. It requires a lot of repression. It requires people not to admit how they really feel. Um, you know, the traditional family is is not a safe place because it's a place where parents exercise almost property rights over their mm-hmm. children. And it, it's often, you know, like that can get really toxic and really bad. I think in the book itself, I think about the dynamic between Janet, who's sort of the mother figure, and yeah. Casey, her daughter, where Janet definitely like wants to believe that what she has set up in that house is a family, and it's yeah. good, and it's nice, and it's working, and there are some minor deviations, but more or less, this is like, this is the picture on, you know, the, the Christmas card, this is what it should be. Um, and Casey, <laughs> who, again, refuses to call Oliver dad just to yeah. like spit in the eye of that, Casey's sees the fault lines in the family and the places where it's not holding together and Mm -hmm. the places where it's not structurally strong. And I think that that dynamic between like Janet trying to hold everything together with duct tape and bubble gum and Casey trying to 
splinter it apart gradually grows over the series into like one of my favorite things and we, and we deal with all these as we've had this conversation now of dealing with uh family structures and, and trans the, the the best part is is now this family uh has to deal with multiple things which whether it be racism or, or someone not uh, agreeing with the way the person is or the family structure is now they also have to deal with some crazy neighbors and some crazy folklore shit uh, on top <laughs> of that. So if it wasn't hard enough to try to figure out how to do life, um, you also have to deal with all this crazy shit and it's a horror comic book. So, yeah. uh, so well, that's how these stories work. The thing you don't want to deal with will always show up on your front door. It yes. always does, you know? <laughs> Well, I mean, like I said, and some of it's I, I, I I've only had to read. I got the opportunity to read issue one, so hoping that like as this progresses through the rest of the series is obviously I believe I'd have to hope that the family gets closer together in a sense, but in the while fighting off or or, or dealing with these broader horror story uh, imagery and, and things that are happening, so um, that would be a way to bring things together by forcing them to basically because of creepy neighbors and, and, and folklore snake shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so it, it, it's a, it, it's a long, a long, I'm guessing a long work. You've heard a lot of work into this and this now coming to, uh, uh, to head because it's available March 22nd uh, through boom studios. So I'm still, I'm guessing it's still March 22nd, right? They haven't pushed it. The comic book world <laughs> is crazy in that sense, right? I emailed someone else about some other podcast episode and they're like, well, it's supposed to come out this day, but in all likelihood it's going to get pushed. So uh, maybe we'll do a different day. Like, but it is March 22nd still, right? <laughs> We're still set for March 22nd. Okay. I hope. I hope. <laughs> and uh, it has top, uh, what at least four covers, right? Five covers? I don't know. Like one, uh, two, three, I'm four. Yeah, there's the Fabio Moon, the Franny. There's Miguel's cover. Uh, I think Ariella's yeah. cover is issue one. I think it's issue it's, one. Uh, Miguel, uh -huh. Ariella, Ramon. And yeah, and there Franny. are. Yeah. And I don't know. I, there's going to be some retailer specific variants. Yes, yes, absolutely. So that's going to be part of the picture too. But Our good friend Joseph Schmalky did one, uh, did a uh, variant cover, I believe, for. Um, now I'm trying to remember where it was for. I had it here. I have a whole one. I have it because it's on the inside cover. Uh, main cover, Ramon Perez does one. Franny, Miguel, Fabio. Uh, Ariel does the Boom and Guarantee. Um, and then Joseph Schmalky, Bad Ombre's exclusive variant cover by Joseph Schmalky. He's a friend of the podcast and mm -hmm. also from Maine. He lives in right hey. outside Portland, Maine. Uh, he did that as well. So that's pretty cool um, when I saw that because – I collect a lot, a lot of stuff he does. So <laughs> yeah, it's very good. I love when those paths cross, like when I really like a book and then you find out some, I found out one of my, my friends, uh, Ben Bishop, who draws for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, last Ronin. He, uh, I was picking up crossover um, by Donny Cates and I didn't realize till like issue 10 that Ben had done a variant cover for issue one. And it's like mm -hmm. finding out 10 issues later about a variant cover is really hard to try to get that variant cover <laughs> because yeah. by that time people have like, taken them all and collected them all. And now you have to buy it off the secondary market. Uh, I was like, why didn't I find out about this originally? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> but, but the, uh, the neighbor's logo is also pretty cool. And I, as a designer, I wanted to point that out. It's so cool. And it was that put on after, because I feel like the solicitation for this whole thing didn't, it was a, it was a virgin cover. Didn't have the trade dress on it. Or was yeah, it just it took a while to get the logo. There were a okay. few versions of it. There was one that was in that, like, script that's on all the elevated horror yeah. these days the like the stepford wives script mm -hmm. but um this with the twigs and the sort of thorns in the logo i really love yes yeah. it adds, um, adds more creepiness to it guy people you had <laughs> creep creepiness is what you need i this is what i love about horror comic books nowadays and some of them and this is i would, I would include the neighbors in that is not the scariness like i feel like some people think that you're gonna get jump scares in all these horror comic books like when you pay, turn a page and you're like holy shit it's the feeling out of uh, uneasiness like yeah. that to me is a huge thing when you're sitting there reading it's uh, that is how comic books can tell you excuse me can can put across how creepy or or horry these these books can be is is by using making you feel uneasy whereas movies and tv shows can do the jump scares and the grossness because 
it's fast and you can't, it's hard to turn off. Whereas a comic book, you just be able to shut the book and be like, okay, I'm not reading that anymore. Um, <laughs> but like the creepiness, the uneasiness one of my favorite horror comic books of all time is Nailbiter. And it's, I, I, there's no scariness to it, in my opinion. It's just like when I, I, I have this feeling of uneasy every time I read the book. Yeah. And so neighbors gives that in a sense that, and gives you feelings that maybe you didn't know were, were, were possible in that sense too, which is cool. No, I think that that sense of doom and dread and just unsettled paranoia, that to me is always the scariest feeling too, because it's like, there are some moments in David Lynch, for example, that just feel like nightmares where like, mm -hmm. you know, something horrible, that moment um, where the man is describing his dream in Mulholland Drive. And he's like, mm -hmm. you and I went out back and we saw a man and it was so scary that I died. And then they get up and go out back and it's the the surprise is not the point the point is just like slowly mounting watching you know the rampaging bear come at you and knowing you're not going to get out of the way fast. Mm -hmm. that's always the scariest feeling for me and i think that these comics allow you to really soak in that like it's about mm -hmm. creating an atmosphere and a world and that to me like fundamentally i think stories are about characters and that, you know, I can't really invest in anything unless there's at least one person I really passionately care about and want them to be okay. But the just living in an alternate heightened reality where things go very badly wrong a lot is that that to me is the fun. That's why you read it. Mm -hmm. Just that and neighbors too is like it's very much a paranoid work. Ma was angry this is scared and i was just like settling down into that mood for five months was kind of nerve-wracking because <laughs> you're just constantly examining your own life for all the ways you might be vulnerable like if somebody yes. really wanted to fuck me up what would they do do exactly <laughs> um but yeah. it turned out at least issue one turned out amazing in my opinion i have the uh ability and the honor to actually pick the people like i don't have an overhead person who's like you should book this person to talk to this person i look at something and i'm like i really want to talk to that person about that book because i like it i'm not going to really usually talk to someone on the podcast if i don't like their work because it seems really <laughs> weird to do um but you know there are some publications out there that are forced to i mean as you know uh being part of it, being journalist as well like sometimes you have to write something because your boss tells you to write something and you write it in your own way and things like that and obviously if it's not against what you believe in it's different mm -hmm. but if you're just writing an opinion piece or, or information about something a, a straight ahead review of you know this movie or this book or whatever um i don't have to do it if i don't like you because if i didn't like your book i'm most likely not going to write anything about it or or, or talk about it because <laughs> i i don't want to just sit here and shit on it all day so the book well, is really good i'm really excited for people to start reading it on march 22nd um i did realize that in the um solicitation it says a tale perfect for fans of Eat the Rich and Nice House on the Lake. Do you didn't write that, did you? Or was that? I the... didn't. But I'm so glad that they compared it yes. to Nice House on the Lake. That's one of my favorite comics going. I love it. Yeah. So I was just I was happy about that too. I haven't got a chance to read to read Eat the Rich yet. That's 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 on my list. I got to read read that one. But Nice House yeah, on the Lake, I, I did it. love, and so I'm pretty happy about that. Is there any other descriptions you'd give people about the neighbors? I don't know. I think that. One of the things people really responded to in, in Ma was that it was folk horror mm -hmm. and it was witchcraft horror. And I can tell you that I have not gotten less obsessed with witches <laughs> um, and witchcraft. So this is definitely like if you want some creepy old ladies in the woods doing weird things with twigs, this this is the book for you. I'm sorry, that There's sounded so wrong. Scary <laughs> plants in this one. You've gone from scary fish to scary yes. plants. There you go. That just, <laughs> it, that's perfect for you. It, it, it's like I said. It's it's. I am big into horror books right now. I I explained to previous episodes of the podcast that I wasn't really into horror movies at all, like at all, mm -hmm. growing up. Mm -hmm. And then I started reading horror comic books, which then opened my eyes to the horror genre as a whole. And now mm -hmm. I can't get enough of both. And I think that I think a lot of other people have gotten into horror comic books because their love for horror movies. And so. I think the horror genre is like you have your superhero genre right now. And then like right below that, like for sales, I would think, because obviously the big two sell a lot of comic books. And then you have your horror right below that. I think horror is just 
crazy good right now and, and it will just throw neighbors into that and actually ma's really you put that in there too it's not that long ago that you put out that book it's available in trade <laughs> grab it in trade available in trade right now. yes uh and then so march 22nd issue one drops uh with a number of covers so grab those covers as well uh april 22nd or 6th right now is when issue two will come out so that's right there and it's five issues uh yeah five issues five issues and then i'm guessing at the end of it there'll be a trade for that too but don't wait i understand people who trade wait <laughs> but don't wait buy the single issues and then buy the trade that's my theory yeah. right double the dip there. for you to to keep and savor the yes. single issues are there so that you can get like the experience all those cliffhangers well i think you that's part of it the clips if you buy the trade first my friend yeah. Well, I think a part of it's part of it. I think the difference in what we've transitioned from in um, TV watching nowadays, so it used to be all the episodes. Like it was like obviously episodic every week, new episode, and then it went to streaming platforms. They just put everything for the se season on there, and then we're kind of back to that week to week thing. So people have discussions about what's going on, and I think that's what's cool about comic books still that, that nowadays is the fact that someone can read on March 22nd, they can read the neighbors issue one, talk to their friends about it and like wonder what happens in issue two. And then the next month they can figure that out again. And I think that's the school. And also if you're like me, I'll read issue one. And then on March or April 25th, Tuesday before new comic book, they all read issue one again and then mm -hmm. issue two the next day. And then, and then by the time I get to issue five, I've read issue one five times. Uh, but you get more into it and you get to see more things out of it. So uh, yeah. I recommend picking up floppy, di floppy issues, but if you can't and you want to wait, there will be a trade at some point, but definitely pick up issue one and tell and your if LCS. It's, if it's not too like pompous to say this about something that you wrote yourself, I do think rereading is good for this one. There's a lot of little things that turn out not to be small. So keep an eye out. I think rereading, let's be honest, people. I started reading comic books in the first place because I wasn't very good at reading and I could get, you know, there's a completion, 22 pages. It's not a lot to read. It's not a lot of text. There's images or imagery to go along with it. Um, but I can also make fun of myself saying comic books are fairly easy to read people. <laughs> and so like reading a comic book more than once is not that hard to do either. That's the other part about it. Like I, it's one of those. And guess what? Read the issue, then go back and just look at the imagery, then go back and do both. Like it's, it's, there's so many different ways that you can take into a comic book nowadays. And, and that's one of the things that you can do is, uh, is read it more than once. And like you said, read it more than once, you get more out of it. So check that out. I, I'm super pumped about it. Um, Jude, is there anything else you wanted to promote or pitch? I mean, obviously you're on social media. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. social media. Nobody's ever liked me better after finding that out. But I'm by Jude Doyle on Twitter. Okay. And I have a newsletter, judedoyle.ghost.io, which you'll find if you go to my Twitter. You know, just okay. like I'm trying to I'm trying to save you from that if you if at all possible. <laughs> um, but no, the neighbors is my big thing this spring. I'm really, really excited. I really hope And I you. I'm hoping that I mean with the way that Ma turned out and the way that issue at least issue one of this one turned out, that you have something percolating for the future that you just can't talk about. Uh, because I'm really hoping that there's more coming from your keyboard typing fingers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely, yes. And I'm glad we also got through this entire episode with talking about the Oscars, and it wasn't about someone getting slapped. <laughs> yeah, that was the that, that I think that's the whole thing. Like, what? No matter what mm -hmm. happened at the Oscars last night, the one thing that was like we talked about the actual Oscars. People talking about that today, <laughs> and not what happened. Like, I don't even remember what happened last year at the Oscars, except for the slap. Do you mean like so there's very little institutionalize it? I was hoping that at least once a year somebody would just come up and get slapped, and you never know who. <laughs> it was just kind of and like I was like, oh. I'm like, oh, okay, be, you know, like it, it could be anybody, it could be Sarah Polly up there, like yeah. But I'm just glad that, and it was if anybody wants to cheer for the underdog in things, you know, just to say that they're they're very. My wife and I were were almost in tears for the first couple of acceptance speeches uh, just because it's taken some people so long to get them or some people were so deserving to get them. And then it kind of went like, eh, for the rest of it, but <laughs> I don't want to get too much into it, but like yeah. at least the very first couple of awards were like very, very like just hearing uh, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones. I, 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 it's all I could ever picture him saying, by the way, is just Dr. Jones. Um, but hearing yeah. his acceptance speech and, and he grew and, up into a hottie though. He's so handsome oh, and everything in like the cuts. 
you see grow up he's still the same height as he was <laughs> sorry <laughs> well, no sorry but like that's, that's the fate of some of us some of us don't get to be that tall <laughs> i watched watch him walk up there i'm like oh my god they have to lower the microphone for him no he's great he's just loving li that's the big thing to me it's like he's just loving life loving the experience like when they interviewed him before uh the the Oscars started on the red carpet it was just like i'm just happy to be here and all that stuff and, and the fact that he has such a great story behind him and then jamie lee curtis jimmy lee curtis basically being in all kinds of movies over the hi history of mankind or <laughs> human humankind i should say uh is um and finally getting something and, and she was excellent in that in that movie uh whether again from that point on, whether you liked it or not, that's a different story that we don't want to get into. We don't have another hour <laughs> to talk about that. It, the very first couple ones, I was very happy I watched and then went to bed. But uh, the uh, the Oscars are an interesting, interesting animal, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no one got slapped, and then we'll just leave no it at that. No slap. No slaps. They did not take my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> but it would have been great, just like Oscars, like um, uh, I got uh, posters, like a series of posters of just the different people in the categories like fighting posters you know like boxing <laughs> posters it would have had like the different people like you know and just like subliminally just put those out there don't say they're the slap posters but like they're the fight uh, posters that would have been great but mm, so pretty good. Yeah. find you on uh twitter uh and you mentioned that and i'll put it in the link uh, on on the podcast as well so people can find that as well and follow your um interesting twitter right <laughs> it's it's up and down. We don't know. We don't know what's happening there. But you know, I'm I'm definitely on Twitter. That's the game. But well, you're one of you're one of the people that have stuck it out too. So there's that too. Um, <laughs> I'm still there. I yes. have less reason to be there than anyone because I'm not good at it. My tweets are not beloved. I've been main character in the past, <laughs> and yet I just like even when it all went to shit, I was like, no, I'm staying here. I'm watching this website die. Yes, you will never oh, get rid of me. You're gonna you're gonna be one of those people who are like, see, I was there when it failed. Not like the same yeah. people say I was there before it was famous or popular. You're gonna be like, I was there the day that it went down and it was no longer yeah. there anymore. I it's was like there. All posting like their Titanic gifts. Like I want to yes. be propeller guy. Yes. I want to be the one who bounces off the propeller on the way down. I'm memorable. I don't have to do a lot. I'm not in love with anybody. I just <laughs> I want to go out with a bang. You know. And I also feel like there's some people out there I've talked to who are like, if you're not there also, it's more noticeable that you're not there anymore. And so like, there's yeah. that too. Like, I feel like you have to, you're pub you're promoting a book. You've got to get a, someone to buy your book. So if there's more, someone on Twitter that listens to you and says, buy your book, they're going to buy your book, which if you weren't on there, then maybe they wouldn't have. So it's yeah. you're, you're going to market yourself and, and hopefully someone goes out there and buys the neighbors from Boom Studios. Yeah, that's the thing. I always feel like a jerk asking people to actually read something I've written. Yeah. I feel like I'm lucky enough that I even got asked to write it. But I they do they have to sell the books so that they can pay the artists. So like do it for the artists, you know? Like and I, you, I, and, I, and if they don't, no one buys your book, you're not going to be able to do another one either. So <laughs> Exactly. Oh, I would love to do another one. I love these so much, but yeah we'll see well hopefully people go out there and buy the neighbors uh like i said uh even if this the story is great but even if you buy issue one cover a just because of the covers dynamite that's that's oh. there's that too uh, i tell your lcs that if you like issue one to make sure they get issue two as well because that's a big thing too the issue one to issue two sales is a huge thing for for uh publishers and writers and, and creators on that mm -hmm. too so um yeah, March twenty second, it hits the shelves at, on your at your LCS, and I'm guessing you can go to boomstudios.com for more information about that as well. Um, I really appreciate you jumping on here and, and changing the time too. I was supposed to do it an hour ago, but time there's a bunch of things that went into it, so I appreciate you <laughs> adjusting your schedule for us too, and uh, and uh, hope the 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 debut of of Neighbors goes well for you. So thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, thank you so much. <laughs>